Thank you. Okay, it works. Uh, so uh, it's great to be back here. I was here about uh, seven years ago, and uh, uh, on a personal note, I work with UAV for about 16 years now, and uh, we've written several papers, and it's truly a pleasure uh, working with you. So uh, with that, uh, let me uh, talk about today's talk. So uh, I'm going to be looking at light transport, and at the outset, I want to limit myself to ray optics, okay? Uh, because this is pretty broad, and if you think about all the ways light propagates in a scene, so you have this very straightforward uh, direct reflection that happens, and this is something that most of us uh, assume, especially in computer vision, uh, but really there's a lot of interesting uh, light pathways in addition to this, so you could have uh, reflections between scene points, like almost all of this auditorium has uh, into reflections, and of course, the light can penetrate through a translucent object. It could be skin, it could be wax, and so on. And this is known as subsurface scattering. And finally, this entire scene could be immersed in a volumetric medium. It could be fog, dust, murky waters, and so on. So together, all of these interesting pathways of light transport give rise to the various appearances that we see every day. Okay. And I believe that if you want to study this, you know, the scene in a deep manner, you need to understand light transport. Very similar to Morning's talk where uh, Bill Freeman said you have to probe the materials with a stick. Here I'm trying to probe scenes with optics, right? And uh, so uh, essentially what we would want to do is to try and model, render, simulate light transport, measure light transport, invert light transport, and so on. And uh, uh, the, the, the real complexity comes not from individual light bounces, because that's pretty well understood in physics and optics. The complexity comes from the sum total of millions, potentially infinite number of light transport pathways and interactions that happen in a scene almost in instantaneously, right? And so, uh, uh, Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about how to tame uh, the complexity of this light transport for several applications. In fact, I'm going to look at three different applications. And uh, here's the idea. The idea is not explicitly modeling light transport, but instead, if you can smartly control illumination and imaging, and perhaps the medium itself, you can simplify light transport drastically. And once you simplify light transport, uh, you can then apply very simple algorithms uh, for many applications. And so this conference says uh, 3D visual computing. So let me start with uh, the first application. This is uh, 3D reconstruction of objects. While we have done a lot of work in this area, uh, there's still lots of challenges, right? So for example, if you're looking at uh, these difficult materials, could be metallic objects, aluminum foil, plastic bubble wrap, ice cubes, and so on. Uh, it's very, very hard to scan these kinds of objects because light bounces around and penetrates through in very interesting and complicated ways. And you could not use just a laser range scanner to, any, uh, to get 3D models out of this. And so uh, we've built a sensor that can reconstruct almost all of these objects very, very well with very simple algorithms. And the idea is, again, to control lighting and imaging in a particular way so that you simplify light transport, okay? And so here's uh, the sensor that we have built. It's a, uh, it's a pretty benign-looking sensor. This, we call this EpiScan 3D. Uh, it's actually a projector camera system. Uh, the projector consists of a raster scanning laser projector, you know, one of those uh, uh, pocket projectors that you can buy. And it's very low power. It's for desktop you know, presentations and so on. So you have a raster scanning laser that just projects images at 60 hertz. Now, the camera is, again, uh, a very simple camera. It's a rolling shutter CMOS camera. You could have one or two, depending on whether you want to do uh, structured light-based 3D reconstruction or active stereo and so on. And the magic really happens in this tiny board that we have created uh, that controls these two uh, devices, OK? So let me show you, before I tell you what I do with this, let me show you a few videos that this device can capture. These are all raw videos, okay? So these are two videos that I'm going to show. Um, 
they're raw, so in fact, you can uh, say every uh, even frame could be the left video, odd frames could be the even video, you know, the right video, and so on. And in this video, you're going to see uh, different kinds of objects placed, and you will see the different types of light transport effects captured directly in different views, okay? Uh, so here's um, the video. This is a, a wax bowl. It's very translucent, but look at the left image. It's very opaque. And look at this mirror ball, and there's a lot of mirrors, and where's all the reflections gone there? There is no processing here. There's no software that is harming this. In fact, this is just direct video captured by the sensor. I, it basically did not capture any of the strange reflections that go on. Uh, it did not capture all the subsurface scattering that happened. All of the interesting stuff that happens is here. All of the interreflections between surfaces, all of that is here. Okay? And so there is no, there's no noise here, there's nothing. This is just raw video from the sensor. Okay? Uh, so how do we do this? It's actually very, very simple. Um, what we do is we take the camera and the projector, we place them side by side in a rectified configuration. So if you know rectified configuration just means it's looking straight ahead side by side. Okay, and so uh, this raster scan is basically looking at each row, and each row in the projector and the camera are epipolar rows, right? Epipolar lines. And that means as I'm scanning each of this row, the only light that you're capturing here is the light that is on that plane, okay? And so by synchronizing this laser projector with the rolling shutter of this camera, you get rid of all of these reflections. Okay, so you can put a mirror there, and it doesn't matter. You can now uh, uh, remove these effects. Now, of course, you can do the opposite. Uh, this is called non-epipolar imaging. That means you block out that row, and you capture everything else. So you capture all the interesting stuff that's happening uh, because of light transport. Okay? And that's it. That's it. Okay? It's a very, very simple sensor, um, very energy efficient. In fact, there's a lot of theory about how to build energy efficient illumination and uh, imaging devices. This turns out to be optimal in a particular sense. And now you have these kinds of new videos that were not possible to capture before. These can be used for 3D reconstruction. For example, if you look at this metallic object, you have a lot of interreflections there. And there's no way you can post process this out. Okay? Uh, you cannot treat this as noise. And in fact, if you use uh, the best reconstruction algorithm, you don't get anything there because there's a lot of light bouncing around. And scanning metallic objects, this is the reason it's hard. Uh, but if you look at this, it's perfect, right? Because we never captured all these complicated light bounces to begin with, right? We simplified light transport drastically so that an ordinary algorithm can uh, beat the most complicated algorithm you can think of. Right? Uh, so you can do this with uh, subsurface scattering as well. So this is a uh, bottle, and if you shine a laser beam at it, you'll see the diffusion. Uh, so it's, again, hard to reconstruct. Uh, it does very, very well. Again, there is no uh, new algorithm here at all. It's just the sensor is so good that it gives you the data that you need to apply a traditional algorithm. Right? So here's another one. Uh, this is scanning ice blocks. And this is pretty hard because if you use a laser range scanner, it could be time of flight, whatever it is, because light goes through this ice and then comes back from different depths, you get sort of a flattened appearance of ice. It's very hard to scan ice. Okay? And it does perfectly well. So you get the surface of this ice. Right? And you can do this with bubble wrap. Uh, here I'm showing just the disparity map because it's a little bit hard to show the actual 3D model. Uh, it works very well. Okay? Uh, so here's another one. This is uh, aluminum foil. There's a lot of specular interreflections here. And uh, it does very well, except you know, all of these black regions just means it's shadowed, so you're not getting any returns at that point. Uh, here's another example. Uh, this is, again, this is uh, a lampshade made of brushed metal, and the brush, the microstructure, is going to create all kinds of weird anisotropic light transport between points. And you can use the best algorithm out there. You can use whatever algorithm you can think of. It's, it's going to be a disaster 
uh, because there's no way to look at uh, these kinds of long-range interreflections, whereas our method just works perfectly well. Okay, uh, so here's another view of that, and so on. So it can scan a lot of these difficult materials. Okay, now of course there's another very important benefit to this, and this is uh, robustness to ambient light. And here I'm going to show you a video of how to scan a light bulb when it's on. Okay, uh, so here you have. Uh, on the left is regular imaging. Once you turn on the light, you can't see anything there. You can project patterns you want, but you can't see anything. So here, look at these patterns. The light bulb is on, and I can see all of these patterns that I'm projecting. And so this light bulb is about 1,600 lumens, rated for 1,600 lumens, and the projector we have is rated for 10 lumens. Okay, So the ambient signal is 1,600, and if you capture that, because of short noise, you have something that is square root of 1,600 that's significantly greater than your signal, which is 10. And in this case, if you had done an ordinary imaging, there would be no way to beat the physics, and you would be screwed, right? And in this case, uh, we are able to uh, uh, image the light bulb when it's on, right? And of course, after that, it's a very straightforward process to create a 3D model uh, out of that. Now, of course, this is just... 1,600 lumen to uh, uh, 10 lumen, but what about sunlight? Sunlight is about 80 to 100 kilolux, okay, 80 to 100 kilolux, right? And this is, again, the same 10 lumen projector. And we are actually capturing all of the light patterns. There's no way you can see these patterns with your naked eye. This is all visible spectrum, right? Everything is visible spectrum, so whatever I talk about here can be used in other wavelength spectra and so on. Uh, but this is remarkable because there is no noise here, right? You don't have to subtract images, which is going to be very, very noisy, because the ambient light is really big. Now, the square root of that is still significantly higher just than 10, right? And uh, so if you don't believe me, this is the, you know, the regular imaging. You can increase the aperture to see if there's any pattern. There's no pattern there. Right, you can reduce the aperture, still there's no pattern there. Uh, you get the patterns very well. So this kind of acts like an outdoor connect, very cheap outdoor connect. Uh, very high resolution because you can use a very high resolution camera. Right? In fact, Microsoft would have loved to see a very high resolution depth map rather than a time of flight based system. This would give you that. Right? So uh, this is active stereo. This is one where we are using two cameras. And we're using the pattern to do texture matching. Uh, this is my son, by the way. I'm teaching him how a light meter works. Uh, so it's a little bit hard. At three-year-old, it's, it's, it's hard. But you can see all of these patterns on a shirt, right? Uh, it's a little bit defocused, the projector. But you can see a lot of these patterns. And you can just use a standard SSD-based stereo matching to get real-time depth, right? So the range of this uh, system uh, as we have built now, is about two meters, okay? Remember, this is only 10 lumens, and we can do two meters in sunlight. Now, if we had done this really well, that means we aligned this projector and camera very well, we synchronized it even more accurately, uh, we used slightly bigger pixels in our camera, you can go up to five to six meters, okay? And that is the range of this projector in complete darkness. So we can achieve the same range as it is in the darkness, uh, but in bright sunlight, right? Uh, now, NASA is very interested in this uh, sensor, and they've uh, given us a recent grant to try and see if we can you know, make this space ready, okay? Uh, the reason is, if you go to the moon, let's say a rover, and we, we're proposing to let the rover go to the pole of the moon, uh, the sunlight is very bright because there's no atmosphere. Right? In fact, it's about 30% brighter than on the Earth. And of course, there are lots of these polar caves, and they're icy caves, and they're very dark. And so you have to have uh, a sensor that has an incredibly wide dynamic range in order to give you this uh, uh, depth map at, in all conditions. So uh, they took our sensor, and they've done a lot of experiments on a robot in uh, Moffett Airfield, and so they have this sort of moon-like terrain, if you will, and there's rocks and so on. 
and you can see the difference between our sensor and the, the, the regular one, uh, you can see that the shadows as well as sunlight, it just fills up much faster, okay? And uh, it truly expands the dynamic range uh, significantly, okay? All of this is happening just because we place the sensor side by side and we are imaging only one row at a time and the synchronization is doing things really fast at 60 hertz, right? Uh, now, another interesting thing you can do with the same sensor is what's known as disparity gating. So instead of placing them side by side, just turn them around like this, perpendicular, and so that means you're illuminating columns, right? If you're illuminating a column, you're sending a plane into the world, and if you're imaging a column, you're imaging a plane in that world. Now, by setting these columns at certain distances, you can scan a particular distance in the world, right? So it, it's kind of like OCT without the coherence and in a bigger scale, right? So you can use this kind of depth gating or disparity gating uh, to uh, see through smoke, for example. So that means you're capturing light from only one particular depth in the world, okay? And there's a lot less scattered light in between. And the interesting thing in terms of dynamic range for this is that you can specify whatever exposure you want at the farthest depth, for example, uh, rather than capturing all of the depths, okay? So you can put the bits where you want. So it, the sensor becomes very efficient. Okay, so uh, let me uh, switch gears and talk a little bit about uh, a second application. This was one sensor that we built. Uh, this is about uh, imaging um, through a surface for subsurface scattering. Uh, one of the most common applications is seeing through skin, right? And uh, there are numerous uh, ideas of how to build imaging systems, lighting systems to see through skin and how much you can penetrate and so on. Uh, there's a lot of this research, but here I'm going to talk about one particular application uh, that we are interested in, and this is imaging and analysis of uh, microvascular blood flow, okay? So non-invasively, can you image the blood vessels, uh, the flow of the blood in real time, get the properties that are useful for doctors? Now, of course, this is uh, something that's still in research in the medical field, uh, in fact, the doctor explained to me uh, like this, you know, microvascular blood flow, why is it important? He said, uh, think about, um, you know, a logistics company like FedEx or UPS, okay? Their job is to deliver packages, right? So you think about blood delivering nutrients uh, to your tissue. Now, you could have a van go really fast on the highway and then get stuck as they get off the highway into the small streets, Right? And if you're stuck there and you don't deliver your package, this is sort of the last mile problem in logistics. And you have the last mile problem in circulation as well. Okay? And this is something that uh, doctors have been trying to research. But the problem is you, if you can't monitor this continuously, it's very hard to make hypotheses in this area. So uh, you, as I said, looking through skin is kind of hard now. Of course, I'm dark-skinned. Because of melanin pigment, it's harder to penetrate through my skin than lighter skin. Uh, but there are several you know, areas, which is uh, underneath your fingernails, maybe my earlobes and lips, and so on, where it's more translucent. Uh, but actually, the most translucent part of your body is your tongue, right? So you can take a camera, and you stick it on top of a tongue, you do some computational illumination, you can start seeing all the vessels very, very clearly. Okay. So this is something that we have been doing for uh, a year and a half now, and this software has already been distributed to uh, the doctors, and they've been doing a lot of trials with it. Uh, so here's what the device looks like. This is an ordinary you know, microscopic camera. Uh, you can buy this thing. And uh, of course, this is known as dark field imaging. That means you can use uh, some green LEDs to illuminate the tongue. Uh, and this is actually the vasculature of a pig tongue. Okay, the, uh, the projector makes it even more worse than what I want it to look like. Uh, but it's showing uh, these kinds of vasculature, and this is about 10 to 20 microns. Okay? 
And uh, so the goal is to be able to uh, analyze these kinds of videos, enhance them, remove the subsurface scattering effects, and produce statistics that are useful for research. Right? And so uh, this is what we did. The first thing you can do is you can take these kinds of videos. So you can see the barely uh, the flow that's going on. So it's a very hard image processing problem as well. Um, now, if you place this camera on your tongue, and of course your hand shakes, and the tongue moves, and you have breathing, and you have heartbeat, and all of that, uh, you can stabilize this video very well. Okay, And uh, you look at the motion signature. This is the blue pattern here. You can decompose that into sensor motion, heartbeat, and uh, breathing rate. Right? So it's very simple to do, just a frequency decomposition. Uh, you can do that. And so this is constantly monitoring what's going on. Uh, you can also uh, reduce the amount of scattering by modeling how light propagates through this tissue. And you have to understand the, sort of the three-dimensional structure of these vessels and so on. Uh, you can get something like this. Okay? This is sufficient to do very simple image processing to actually extract all of these uh, micro vessels. And this is important because one of the measures that the doctors are looking for is there any lot of perfusion. That means if you don't see enough blood vessels there, uh, that's a problem. That means not enough blood is going into that region. And of course, for the first time, you can now look at a point and you can get the blood flow velocities at a particular depth. right? So uh, uh, Bill is here, or no, I can't see Bill. But uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was use uh, Bill's work. It's an amazing piece of work where you're looking at tiny motions and exaggerating them. And so we wanted to see if there's uh, enough information there uh, to try and analyze this. So this is uh, if you do some simple frequency domain decomposition and you just enhance those frequencies, you see all of this stuff. In fact. If we uh, increase this resolution maybe by 10 times, let's say, uh, we are able to see individual red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets and so on. So one day, perhaps, we could immediately just non-invasively measure CBC, which is complete blood count. Right? So if you think about hundreds of millions of blood tests, a billion blood tests done uh, per year, can you image uh, CBC, can you compute CBC accurately enough, uh, non-invasively? And this is something that uh, we would love to do. Okay? So uh, once you have this kind of information, we know that we can extract it from there, because it's there. right? We've seen that. Uh, it's there. And we gave this to the doctors, and the doctors did a lot of critical care experiments. And they initially uh, did it with pigs. Uh, they brought the pigs in. They bled them. For a while, they stopped bleeding, they observed, and then they resuscitated them. Okay? So this whole process could take a few hours. And all the while, we are monitoring uh, the microcirculation that's going on. Okay? And so uh, here are a couple of pics that we are looking at. This is a raw input video. And you have the heartbeat, uh, breathing rate, sensor motion, skeleton. And this is the histogram of the blood flow velocities. Okay. You want to see moderate to high flows. You don't want to see very low flows. Okay. And once you start bleeding, this is bad. This is bad because all the flows sort of stopped here. Right? And these are, by the way, I should say that these are situations where the blood flow monitor, you know, blood pressure monitor is not telling you much at all. It's very subtle things that are happening in the microcirculation. And so you can keep doing that. You can stop the bleeding, and you can watch as the you know, time goes on. The histograms keep changing. And you resuscitate, and you watch, and you say, oh, the pig recovered perfectly. right? Uh, so you can tell a story about how this thing unfolds. And so here's another pig. This is actually, uh, it was brought in unhealthy. Okay? It had a lot of uh, zero flow. And they bled the pig. And it, as usual, the blood flow velocities went lower and so on. And after resuscitation, this pig became much more healthier than it was uh, than it, when it came in. So uh, you can now you can try and monitor this in real time. Another interesting thing that you can do with this is you can recognize the different kinds of blood flow, abnormal blood flow. 
Uh, so here again, maybe you can't see uh, very well. You can see barely, right? So that's called stop and go flow. The doctors have seen this video again and again, and they say, oh, there it is. But, you know, for a computer, it's not that easy to recognize those flows. And, of course, here's another example where there is uh, almost no flow. In fact, there's no flow, right? You don't see anything. So you can write a classifier that basically looks at this video. Blue means there's a lot of flow. Green means there's stop and go flow. And then red means no flow. And as you start bleeding, you'll start seeing more and more green, more and more red, and so on. And after you resuscitate, suddenly back to blue. That means the pig recovered. Okay? Uh, so this kind of uh, software is now going to be used by a group of international surgeons everywhere to try and figure out, for example, causalities in these kinds of microcirculation. This has never been done before. Right? People have observed the highways of blood flow, veins and arteries, but the microcirculation is much, much harder to analyze. Okay? And so we are hoping that this kind of software can help them along. Another interesting thing you can do with this, and this is some you know, more standard imaging, so you can use different focal settings of your camera, and you can get three-dimensional structure of this uh, micro blood vessels. Okay? This is actually a pretty challenging problem because for each pixel, you're looking through the ray, and you have many different vessels, one behind the other, that could be. Right? So most of computer vision algorithms assume that there's only one occluder, right? And you know, in this morning's talk, we talked. You know, uh, Mark Poliface talked about stuff behind each other, and you could have a lot of layers there. And uh, estimating this is pretty hard. I should say we don't have ground truth for this yet. It's very hard to collect ground truth of this structure uh, very carefully, but we're hoping to uh, do that soon. Okay. So, uh, so that was about. Uh, subsurface scattering. So this is just one example. Uh, in the last part, uh, I want to talk about uh, a big project that's happening in my lab. And uh, these days, everybody wants to do things on a car. And can you do computational illumination and imaging on a car? Okay. Um, the, the prime real estate area for this is the headlight. Okay. So if you think about the headlight today, 99.9% .9 of the cars, you have a switch off, switch on, you have high beam, low beam. Maybe you have steering, beam steering with respect to your steering wheel and so on. But if you think about the kind of control we have over lighting and imaging, this is way too less, right? So as computations are beginning to govern almost every aspect of the car, the headlight, which is sort of there all the time, we, we're not using that, right? And so uh, our goal was to be able to create a headlight that is programmable, that can do many different tasks for, with the goal of increasing safety uh, for you and everybody else on the road. And of course, this is nighttime uh, safety. So what do you mean by a programmable headlight? It's actually a pretty simple idea, OK? Uh, instead of using a, just a single light bulb or a bunch of LEDs and so on, just put a projector there, right? Take this digital projector and put it in there, right? And so that means you take a single beam and you're able to split it a million different ways, right? So this is what this projector is doing on the screen already, right? So we have unprecedented control over lighting. Now, of course, you can keep a sensor. It could be a camera. There's a beam splitter there. It's, it's looking out into the world. And there's a very fast processor that captures, you know, that looks at the images, processes it, and then controls the lighting. Okay? What I described here is what's known as a projector camera system. It's been around for 40 years. Uh, but nobody was in a hurry to put this thing on a car and drive it at 70 miles per hour. Right? So this presented unique challenges on how what kind of latencies can you expect? What kinds of tasks can you do? What kinds of accuracies can you expect? Now, let's see how fast this headlight should react. So here's a video of me driving in Pittsburgh at 70 miles per hour. And this is 30 hertz. You can call it real time. This is what's happening. And if I wanted to react to traffic that's oncoming, and if I'm too late, the traffic goes somewhere else. I mean, the cars can go somewhere else, the pedestrians go somewhere else, and we are left with a very hard prediction problem, 
Okay? But instead, if you, this is 500 hertz. Now, if your latency is short enough, then you can start not worrying about the prediction, but you can do interesting things with your lighting. Okay? So, of course, we're not a tier one or a car manufacturer, so we started by using a, a regular DLP projector, and uh, we did this to the poor projector. We know every single signal that's in this thing. Uh, hacked it, we put our own chip, we put our own heat sink, our own board. Of course, you try to put it back together, of course, it doesn't fit. Um, <laughs> The, the, because this is a DMD projector, uh, the reaction time we can achieve, that means imaging, processing, and projection happens within one millisecond. So this is the world's fastest projector camera system. Okay? And it, it took us a long time. We developed uh, the PCB for this. We have very complicated data flows through FPGA, GPU, ARM core, everything. Right? And uh, the, the result of this is that we are able to do one billion light beam adaptations per second. Okay, what can we do with this? What can we do with this? First, what can we do with this in the lab? A lot of fun, actually. So you can illuminate the explosions. So as the explosions are happening, the image, it's, you're imaging the explosion, you're tracking the particles, and you're illuminating it. Right? So this is in my very messy lab, and it's only illuminating stuff that is moving. Right? And this shows the incredibly low latency and the tracking and so on uh, that's going on here. Okay? So initially, this thing was on a cart, and of course, how do we, after a while, we got some courage to put it on a car. It was on, a, on the hood. Uh, this, this suction cups were, you know, we had to make sure that these things are really good, because if you're driving at 70 miles per hour and this thing flies off, that's going to be bad. Uh, so these are uh, Hollywood suction cups, right? So they use that to uh, film uh, movies uh, from the car. And then, of course, after a while, we did a lot of uh, road tests, and then we eliminated the PC, and then you have uh, two headlights now, and so on. And of course, every time I give this demo, we've given lots and lots of demos to CTOs and uh, everybody else. They say, oh, it's too ugly. It's outside. It's big and blah, blah, blah. And uh, we said, oh, OK, fine. Uh, we'll put it inside this Ford F350. So it's actually inside this F4, uh, 350. Uh, looks exactly like the ordinary headlight, but it can do a lot of stuff. Okay. So it took a long time to engineer to get to this point. Now let me show you what it can do. So one thing it can do is you can use your high beams as much as you want, and you can turn off only a few pixels to the other drivers who are coming at you. Right? So it could be any number of cars, any number of lanes in front of you, oncoming, and so on. Okay? Uh, so here's a few videos of this, and on the top, is what happens if there is no glare free, free done. So that means it's, it's glaring you. At this point, I'm completely blind. The camera can see other things, but the human being is blind. OK? And uh, here, you should look at the third headlight, the third eye, if you will. It's pretty comfortable to drive, because it's tracking you, and it's not illuminating you or sending very less light towards you. Okay? And the speed at which we can do this is the car can go at 100 miles per hour, and the other guy could be coming at 100 miles per hour. So the relative velocity of 200 miles per hour, this is the speed at which we can react. Okay? Now, for the guy who has this headlight, well, what about, you know, why is this useful for that guy? Uh, because he can use his high beam all the time. He doesn't see any change, because only a few percent of the pixels are turned off, and there is natural defocus in the projector, and you don't see any changes at all. Uh, so here are a bunch of videos uh, captured from an iPhone. Uh, ignore the skew, because we placed the headlight up on top. Uh, in some of these videos, we are doing glare-free, and some of them we are not. Anybody can guess where we are doing glare-free? If you guess, you'll be the first person in two years. 
Uh, it's very, very hard. It's very hard. So there's virtually no difference to you. So you can use your high beam really well, okay, without glaring anybody on the road. Uh, it works for the rear view as well. So you can't have a big truck coming just behind you with his high beams asking you to, you know, go fast because you don't uh, glare that person, right? So uh, here's my rear view mirror. And, uh, in this case, we're driving slowly. Uh, just didn't want to make, you know, hit the other car. Now, this kind of system is already in used in Europe with a bunch of LEDs, but the performance is very, very low. It means if you had four LEDs, 10 LEDs, 12 LEDs, you have to switch off a significant fraction of your light, and that gives me no reason to buy this thing, okay? And whereas our resolution is so high and the latency is so low, our throughput is very high. Okay, so it beats virtually every system uh, that's out there. As I said, we've done demos to a lot of people. I'm trying to convince here the U.S. Secretary of Transportation to you know, write some regulations that can allow these kinds of things. Uh, but really, this is not what we started to do. In fact, we started to do, uh, solve a problem that is much, much harder. And this is one night where I was driving back home there's no snow in Israel, so this is, I can't, you have to imagine, you have to imagine. Uh, it, it, this is a really, really hard thing because you have all the snowflakes coming straight at you. It's like Star Trek, right? The captain says, engage, and all the stars come straight at you. It doesn't happen that way, but it's, it's pretty hard. Uh, so if you're able to reduce the visibility of the snow somehow so that you can see the road, you can drive better. Okay, so here's a crazy thought that we had. Because we have such high resolution and such low latency, we are able to stream light in between the snowflakes. Okay, uh, you're able to image the particle and very quickly switch off the light ray to that particle. Okay, and because we're doing this at very high speed, you don't have to worry about the prediction problem where a particular snowflake is going to go. Just a linear prediction solves this issue. Okay. So, uh, I mean, people thought I was crazy, and if you look at this image, this is the instantaneous snapshot of a very strong rainfall, right? There's a lot of place here to stream light, so it's not so bad, it's not so bad, okay? And we started with, um, uh, you know, in the lab, we have, this is 90 millimeter per hour rain. I don't think it has happened in Israel, ever. <laughs> Uh, there's no rain here. You're streaming light in between, right? The rain has disappeared. So uh, the point is not to miss every single drop. The point is to miss enough so that you can see the road better, right? So in this case, it's 70% visibility improvement. You're losing 5 to 10% of the light. Uh, works for snow as well. Uh, here's fake snow in front of the car. Whenever we are ready to do experiments, there's no snow and vice versa. So we had to use fake snow. There's a big difference. In fact, if you sit in the car and look at it, you suddenly see the road. That's a huge uh, difference perceptually. Okay, uh, We've done a lot of simulations to say that this is not crazy. I don't want to go into that. It's uh, uh, very quickly, I want to move on. Uh, because we have a projector, we can project anything on the road, right? You can project a movie if you want, but drive-in theater? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, so you, here you can actually project lanes so that you have better contrast between your lane and the next lane, your lane and the sidewalk, your lane and the uh, divider, and so on. And this is very important because when you're driving at night and it's raining pretty hard, you've, you don't see the rain, lane markings, right? It's pretty shiny. And so you are able to now give a better guide for the driver, right? And so. Uh, I just want to show you this picture. This thing is so bright, okay? This thing is so bright and the illumination is so beautiful. Uh, it's not like any other car headlight that you've seen. Uh, and of course, this is a photograph, but the video camera is not that great. So uh, here, we are only projecting on the road, right? So all we are doing is, if you had the road shape and you know the location because then you have the maps, it's just a standard rendering problem. It's a very fast rendering problem, right? So in this case, we projected on both lanes. In this case, you can project on just your lane. Most of the roads in Pittsburgh don't have lane markings, so that's, that's great. Um, 
it works in bright light as well. This is very brightly lit road, actually. And you can see this uh, very well. Again, a single lane and so on. Uh, you can do many other things. You can uh, project directions on the road. Nowadays, people try to project it on, onto a heads-up display. But heads-up display, you have to accommodate close and while you are concentrating on the road. And that becomes harder and harder when you're older and you have glasses and so on. Um, you can project other things. For example, uh, here's, uh, here we projected a crosswalk. Right? So it's as though the crosswalk had been painted. And as you're growing, you, you tie it to the velocity of the car. And you can sort of correct for the position. It's not very accurate yet, but uh, this is something that a master's student is working on, and we hope to get this to be stabilized, right? Uh, so you can do uh, other things like uh, spotlighting a bicyclist. Uh, yeah, you spotlight him uh, without glaring him, clearly. And the speed at which we can do this is you can imagine the bicyclist going at 50 miles per hour in front of you, and you going at 70 miles per hour. We can't test that ever. But that's the speed at which you can track these things. So there's a lot of other stuff you can do with this. You can, uh, on wet roads, you can send less light so that it's specularly uh, less reflecting to the driver. Um, you can do uh, structured light on this road. This is something that we are currently working on because you have very high speed illumination and you can be doing structured light. You don't have to rely on a LiDAR, which is very low res. You have 2D structured light. Right. And you can do other things like uh, um, you know, bumper to bumper, adaptive cruise control, very short distance, right? and very high speed uh, depth estimation, uh, which is not possible with uh, radar, and LIDAR is not very uh, reliable because it's scanning a lot and so on. And the reason you would want to do this is that you can create sort of a platoon effect. And this is an example of uh, computing the distance uh, in front of your car, and almost done. Uh, so you can get this sort of car-to-car -car distance very, very accurately. And if you do this platooning, uh, at least in the intersections, you get big benefits in terms of energy and uh, reducing vehicle consumption, uh, emissions, and so on. So th the idea is create a programmable headlight. This is prime real estate area in your car. Don't waste it. So that you can do many things with one design that leads directly to safety. And the statistics are undeniable. So you have lots and lots of these kinds of statistics because of accidents at night, uh, fatalities, and so on, uh, that you want to uh, avoid. And so hopefully, coming soon to a car near you. So at this point, let me stop and take any questions. Thank you so much.